Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. I'm running for the U.S. Senate under ranked choice voting here in Maine. And I'm here at the Portland Media Center this evening for a People's Summit to have the conversations that don't make it into U.S. Senate debates often. I'm very pleased to be here with Jerry Edwards of the Black-Owned Maine, Black-Owned Business Maine, Black-Owned Maine, sorry, <laughs> Adam Rice of the Maine People's Housing Justice Coalition, and Luke Secura Flanders of Community Water Justice. We're here to not debate each other, but to have a conversation about what the, are the needs of our community. And I'm going to ask each of these gentlemen to uh, introduce themselves a little bit more before we get our conversation started. Jerry? Uh, hello. My name is Jerry Edwards. I'm also known as Genius Black. I'm a creator, a music producer, and an engineer out in the community, but also I am one of the people who my, my good friend Rose Barboza, who founded and started Black Owned Maine. She pulled me in from like day one, and uh, I helped to launch that locally here. Uh, we started here in Southern Maine, but we uh, are a directory of all the black owned businesses in the state of Maine. We also have the Black Owned Maine podcast. Podcast, we call it BOMP. Uh, you can check that out. And then also, we give uh, grants to families and even some financial support to businesses that are BIPOC owned. Uh, so out here trying to make a difference, people vote with their dollars, trying to get those dollars to BIPOC businesses and just raise awareness um, and, and just help Maine to become a place that is really, really welcoming to, to black folks, even though uh, it has this, um, this view of many people that there's no black people here, but they are here. So, <laughs> yes. Thanks, Jerry. Adam? Yeah, um, my name is Adam Rice. Um, I primarily work with the Maine People's Housing Coalition and uh, another organization called Youth Without Barriers. Uh, we're a peer-led uh, group of Portland residents uh, that operate in a non-hierarchical fashion uh, using peer support and mutual aid to uh, provide uh, help and resources to our unhoused community members. Um, also, I am uh, working with the Church of uh, Safe Injection currently, which is a group doing harm reduction work in the city, and we're working to uh, get some policy change so we could potentially have uh, overdose prevention facilities in the city and prevent loss of life in many different communities. Thank you, Adam. Luke? Uh, hi, my name is Luke Sikara Flanders. Um, I'm currently working with Community Water Justice. Um, which is a network of frontline communities across the state of Maine um, fighting against um, the uh, privatization of our uh, public water sources as well as the um, uh, extraction and sale of water for, um, for private profit, namely the bottled water industry. Um, I'm also working with uh, Sunrise Maine, which is um, a uh, movement of, led by youth um, fighting for a Green New Deal. Um, and uh, on a more local led level advocating for other policies um, which um, bring us through a just transition to a more sustainable economy. Um, I've also worked with a number of or other organizations such as um, the Maine Environmental Education Association with whom I'm a Maine environmental change maker. Um, I've worked with uh, Just Me For Just Us. Um, I'm a Maine, uh, a, a Maine seed uh, with Seeds of Peace. Um, and yeah, and a, a number of other organizations. Um, yeah, so Great. thank you. Well, Luke, you first came to my attention when I think you were nine years old and you gave a, a really impactful speech to the Freiburg Town Council, I believe it was. Yeah, it yeah. was um, the Main uh, Public Utilities Commission. Main Public Utilities um, Commission. Yeah, we were uh, discussing a 45-year uh, contract um, the, uh, Nestle was looking to secure a 45-year contract in our town to extract um, significant amounts of water. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was testifying in opposition to that because it essentially gave them unfettered access to um, our area's um, large aquifer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, after a, eventually that led to an entire process, a huge legal battle, which led to um, a nationwide precedent sending a case um, wherein Nestle won. Um, they've now secured a 45 year contract um, to, and you know, now <laughs> in front of my house even, you know, 24 seven water trucks are rolling in and out of our town. Um, well, I remember one of the really high impact things that Luke said at the time was he said, if this contract goes through, I'll be 54 years old 
by the time it ends, you know, and he was in fourth grade at the time, and I, I was a teacher at the time, just, I've just retired from teaching, and uh, that really made an uh, impact. So sometimes it's like putting things in context that yes. really makes us uh, kind of understand where they're at. Could you tell us a little bit about your business and kind of the context of your uh, music producing business that you're doing here in Maine, Jerry? Uh, absolutely. I'm a, uh, yeah, one of the businesses I have, um, as a music producer, again, my name is Genius Black. I'm also an artist. I love to collaborate and synergize a lot. Um, I first started making music when I was 15 or 16 back in Texas. That's where I'm from. And I'd say when I was at Bowdoin College, I used to work at WBOR, the campus radio station. I used to have a recording studio down in the basement. And I spent way too many hours uh, in, in college in that recording studio, really learning to hone my craft as a producer, as an engineer. And I'd say when I was probably like 22, 23, I got really, really serious. And now I'm 39. So I've really been at it for years. Um, and for me, the, the process of being a creative person and collaborating with people, drawing in other people's energies, helping them to tell their stories, helping them to achieve a vision. Because I'm a, as a music producer, I'm a very vision-oriented person. That, for me, actually really coincides with the work that I do at Black Owned Maine. Mm -hmm. So one thing about Black Owned Maine as an organization is that we came, we were, uh, uh, we launched this summer. And Rose, uh, my partner, had really wanted to get out and protest. I, I should say that, uh, you know, I had been protesting like out in the streets in Portland for sure. My daughter went to a protest with me. This was after the murder of George Floyd. Yeah. And I think that there was just this turning point with my energy, a lot of people's energy. I was really proud of Portland for standing up. And so in the midst of all of that energy, uh, my, my partner Rose was just kind of like, hey, I, you know, for certain reasons, childcare and stuff, she can't go out and protest. This just wasn't realistic. COVID, you know, we're all out there with masks on, trying to have our voices raised. And uh, she came up with the idea to start the business and to start a online directory of all the black owned businesses in the state of Maine. The joke is, it's not a joke, but people will say, oh, like how many? Can you count them on one hand, maybe two? Well, I mean, we launched with like 60 plus, and now there's over 200 uh, businesses on the directory. So for us, it's, it, was, it really became a way to collaborate and link up with people and network, but also to specifically support black and brown indigenous people in the state of Maine, which there are many, many people, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be refugees, people from the South that moved up here, people that were born here, a lot of biracial people. And uh, we think there's a lot of overlooking on the national level. People forget that there's people of color in Maine. And even in the state of Maine, people don't really create spaces for black and brown people to be vibrant. And so we want to start in an official way and in an organized way to start to financially make a space for these people to, to do what they do but also to just overall for the state of Maine to kind of, you know, after COVID, we know that there's a lot of people who might want to come as tourists, but they don't think Maine is welcome, welcoming to them and people that look uh -huh. like them. Uh -huh. We aim to change that, both cool. inside of Maine as well as people coming from outside of Maine. So that's the type of work that we do. But again, for me, both in the production and black owned Maine, I'm, I'm always in conversations. I'm always collaborating. I'm always trying to feed off of people's energy and see where they're coming from. So I get to live out a lot of just like me. Mm -hmm. uh, my personality and my talents at Black Owned Maine. Cool. I know you're a big collaborator, Adam. Um, the, yeah. t the tent in this summer was just one example of a collaboration that you're involved in. I was wondering if mm. you could tell us a little bit about what was the purpose of the tent in encampment on City Hall? Like, how long did it last? Yeah. Uh, and I also want, want to thank uh, Black Owned Maine, too, because you guys were big uh, donors to our mutual aid tents of supplies and uh, face masks yeah. and other other items and you guys really came through for our community so appreciate you i uh, wanted to start with that um but yeah the uh, the general purpose was to highlight how many people are actually forced to sleep outside due to bad policies at the local level mm -hmm. um one of the issues that was raised uh you know at the time with covid um the soup kitchen where people were getting food was closed uh, we had been transitioning to a mobile uh, food delivery service and the people doing that were stopped by the city um, via the police and uh, you know a lot of people were just like hey you know this is this is just too much you know this is a community that's been wronged for as long as I've been alive by bad policies like this and um, so we really wanted to show that um, and, you know, there's a policy, too, where, uh, you know, in the shelters, they uh, hand out criminal trespass uh, orders. So there's a lot of people that aren't allowed in these facilities. And when the issue of homelessness is raised, 
a lot of times the like the statements we get are well there's this many beds open they should use the shelter and you know there's that's missing from that conversation mm -hmm. you know the same way things are left out of the debate stage or in augusta or down in dc at the city level um, you know, there's a large number of people that a aren't a part of the conversation, and things aren't be, being said that should be by the people we've elected. So everybody here has some different strategies for sort of getting your voice out there and advocating for the things that you care about. I'm just curious, did any elected officials come down to the tent in when Not, you guys were there for like three weeks? So uh, like four weeks? We were there a little over two weeks. The mayor did have a little listening session one day. It did take a, a lot of prompting. Um, uh, Jess Valero still has been in, in pretty close con, uh, communication with the mayor since then. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Tay Chong and uh, possibly Pius both also came down there. Um, you know, Pius has been great. He's always uh, that, that one loud voice that's always uh, standing with the people who demand change. And, uh, I've had a lot of really good opportunities in the past couple of years to thank him for standing up. Um, likewise, with uh, the protests about a year ago when they were opening that new ice facility at Monument Square, uh, you know, Pius was the only one right there with us, you know, cheering us on and saying, you know, this is democracy in action. You know, this is how you change things when they need to be changed. Cool. I'm guessing neither of your U.S. senators came down to. Oh, of course not. I, I wouldn't. Ex I would hope they would, but I don't expect them to, no. Mm. So, uh, Luke, what, what kind of um, advocacy for our water here in Maine would you suggest that we band together and do? I, I, I know some of the answers to this because, of course, your mom, Nikki, has been doing this work for a long time. And I've, you know, I've heard some really good suggestions from her. My impression has been that people in Maine don't really realize that our water is pretty much privately owned at this point, privately controlled. Mm. And yes. we just had a drought all winter. And I think you guys told me that a billion gallons of water are pumped out yeah. of Maine every year mm. and sold in plastic bottles for profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Nestle, or through its brand Poland Spring, is extracting uh, I think it's just over a billion uh, gallons a year now um, out of just uh, 10 locations in the state of Maine. Um, that's, you know, 10 too many in my opinion. But um, yeah, um, some key things we need to see done. Um, for one, it's the removal of uh, corporate influence in all uh, governmental bodies. Um, I mean, in the state house, we're seeing um, multiple paid Nestle employees being appointed to high profile positions such as on the Board of Environmental Protection, um, the Maine Drinking Water Program, um, bodies which are supposed to oversee um, that, uh, um, make sure that regulations are followed and that corporations aren't horribly abusing uh, our environment and because you know the motive of a corporation is to ensure that its profits are you know, as as um, as massive as they can be, um, we simply can't trust paid employees of such corporations to be on our um, regulatory bodies. Um, it does kind of sound like the fox guarding the hen house. Yeah. Exactly, it is certainly. Um, and also, we're seeing um, uh, public uh, water uh, systems being privatized, um, and we're seeing prices being raised. Um, recently, um, the um, main uh, main water company uh, was uh, went under who's which is based in Connecticut underwent a merger with a with a, uh, a water company that's based out in, based in California. So that's a merging of two major corporations, and that means that water systems here in Maine are now being controlled by a nationwide corporation. Um, and, you know, that's never a good sign. That means, you know, monopolies are starting to emerge. And um, when that happens, you know, you know that the, the power, the amount of power we the people have over our water systems is uh, shrinking every day. Um, so we need to ensure that uh, public water systems are publicly owned and operated. Um, and that means securing funding to improving them because, of course, you know, many con there have been a lot of concerns with um, 
aging infrastructure and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, so we need to, yeah, we need to invest in our uh, public water infrastructure to make sure yeah, that people have Yeah, it's reminding me of CMP, which is owned by mm -hmm. a, a multinational energy company based in Spain mm -hmm. and pushing the CMP corridor project on us. I was really disappointed to see a bill at the state level that uh, to uh, make CMP a consumer-owned and operated utility that was, you know, based here in Maine. It kind of died in committee. Didn't exactly die. They said, oh, we'll study it. Um, but I'm curious, uh, Black-owned Maine, do, you know, we've heard a lot about the Paycheck Protection Plan and other government supports for business here during the pandemic. Are, are the businesses that you're working with getting relief from the government? Are they getting help or... I don't actually know the answer for many of the businesses. We, um, we're only in so much contact directly with the businesses. Uh, but of the ones we know of, I've heard of people that have gotten support and people who uh, have applied and got nothing or just don't even really know about it. So um, I guess I don't have a ton of details, but I feel like it's been a pretty uh, kind of a mismatch or wishwash. Like, I don't, I don't think there's been any consistency to that. Um, uh -huh. I know that there are people that have been trying um, but even people that have applied for our our grants that we have, have you know, are offering, um, that we're also trying to get other types of support and even governmental support that hadn't come through yet. So um, I do know that some people are struggling. I don't, I don't, I don't have any like percentages or numbers of who has actually received support. Uh -huh. I used to own a small business before I became a school teacher. I owned like a cafe in Skowhegan, Maine, and uh, ran it for, with my brother for seven years. And it was amazingly hard to be successful as a small business in Maine. Um, you know, we did manage it, but only because it was a tourism-based business, and we would basically make all our money in about two weeks in the summer. And if we did not make that two weeks in the summer, then we did not get through the winter. But yeah. how many, I mean, are a lot of these businesses seasonal and, and dependent on tourism, or we not have, necessarily? Not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's a mixture. I mean, we have people that, on our directory, for instance, that... Um, we have artists, we have people who do hair, like we were just uh, talking about Rafiki shop out here, and they just do these amazing and artistic braids and different styles. So you have people where they really support the local community no matter what, and then you have people that are retailers and people that really are dependent on people kind of traveling up north and things like that um, in the summer. So I, well, I guess appropriately, when you look at all of these businesses across the state of Maine, they really hit kind of all the sectors. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think a little known fact is really how many businesses in Maine are owned by people of color. And uh, it's not just restaurants and maybe the number one or two things that you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I would tell people, go and check out the, the directory and see what's there uh, because really it, it's all the way across the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Hey, um, Adam, how is uh, uh, the real estate market in Portland? Uh, it's a big, you know, a lot of business interest building, a lot of new buildings going up, right? A lot of mm -hmm. high-end housing being built. How is that affecting the decisions that government is making on behalf of the people who live here in Portland? Well, um, you know, I have my own personal opinion that I think our local government definitely works more for the big developers than it does for the renters or the people. Um, you know, if anybody is still unaware of the People First Portland referendums that they can vote on now, um, you know, that should be an indication of, like, what the situation is when the people, you know, want relief with, you know, the rental stabilization, the livable wages and facial recognition software, the climate stuff. And, uh, you know, we for years now we've been going to these meetings and presenting solutions and demanding or asking for change. and. There's never any action. So we do these referendums and the city council has come out to tell people not to vote on the things that have been done in a grassroots way. So, you know, it's uh, pretty obvious that, you know, a lot of the people we're electing are either intent on doing half measures or just giving us lip service. You know, I don't really know another way to put that. Um, but, you know, on the local level, um, one thing that you know more people should know is that the way Portland defines uh, affordable housing is workforce housing, which is uh, that value is often comprised of the area median income, which would include like Cape Elizabeth, like the mansions in South Portland, some of Falmouth, like the whole greater Portland area. So you have uh, or like an income requirement to actually rent these units, which could be, 60 or 70,000 because the way that they're uh, using the percentage 
it, uh, it actually creates a barrier so the people who need it to be actually affordable can't afford it. Um, and likewise, people who hold you know, rental vouchers and assistance uh, through a lot of these programs like Section 8 or BRAP or Shelter Plus, you know, they, they could apply for apartments for five years and nobody would take those vouchers. And uh, you know, it's, it's a shame because the, the assistance that's there is falling through the cracks because there's loopholes and discrimination laws. And then the, uh, the people we've elected to deal with these problems when they happen uh, are more concerned with just saying, hey, we're working on it than actually you know, really getting systematic change. Yeah. I was really proud to earn a DSA Maine's endorsement for my campaign. They had a pretty rigorous, um, you know, process where they really wanted to know what your values were and put your money where your mouth is. And then their five, they kind of warned me, we're not going to really help on your campaign because we have those five initiatives that we're really working on. And I've been amazed at the amount of um, pushback, the, the you know, tens of thousands of dollars of advertising money that's been poured into trying to keep these people first initiatives from passing, particularly rent control seems like a huge issue that's, you know, that I see a lot of signs and, um, you know, it's kind of similar to Nestle. Ne uh, you know, can I turn on a YouTube video without seeing Nestle saying what a good corporate citizen they are for pumping water out of our aquifers, putting them in plastic bottles, trucking them across our roads, and then selling them back to us at a profit. Um, it's, um, it's hard to be up against big money. Um, and I like the idea that by collaborating and working together with other people, that is our strength, yep. uh, listening to each other, helping each other out. Um, yeah, so um, I just had a, a I have a, um, a really good masseuse who's part of Black on Main, and she told me, hey, I got a grant to do marketing for my business. Yes. She was super excited, it. yeah. Awesome. So you guys have been good at getting grants, I think, or you've had some success with, with uh, getting some grant money to. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so a, a couple. Uh, Can you actually, talk about that process a little bit? Because that's kind of a way of people getting some money to, to do some good things with it. Yeah, well, so the first thing I'll say, uh, just because we have been uh, blessed and we've worked hard to be in a position where we are, all, first and foremost, I'll say that we are providing grants ourselves. So if you go to blackownmain.com, you can check out the grants. We're actually changing things a little bit, but uh, there's a family grant and a business grant. So that's something worth looking out because for us, by coming into f funds and we know how finances, especially in communities of color, like that's something that tends to leave way too quickly. And so for us, we are, uh, we are ourselves providing grants. Um, I will say that Rose is the one who actually writes most of the grants and things like that. So she, she would have more information, but I know that a lot of it is just finding, well, first of all, it's finding mentors and people in the community who know more about like being a nonprofit, maybe what you should do next, maybe some of the pitfalls. And so sometimes we have calls and she has a mentor. Uh, she works with, uh, uh, with SCORE. So there's people in the state that help support and they can give you ideas and resources. But then it is just finding grants that you qualify for that where the criteria fit with what you, kind of your mission. Um, and there's deadlines and you have to give you know, certain information. And it's not, I mean, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem like it's super, super difficult. Finding them, I think, can be somewhat difficult. Mm -hmm. We actually just... Um, I guess I won't say what the grant is, but the other day we were uh, having a great conversation with an organization, and for their grant, everything lined up. But for them, for instance, they were saying, well, we're, we're really trying to support a small group of women, right? With everything that you have going on, if there was a group of women who were making these decisions, this would be a fit. And I was like, no, it's this woman and this man. All right, cool, that's not a fit. We'll move on and look for other things. That same uh, organization, and the representative who we were speaking to then told us about five or six more grants that not that we would get, yeah. go check on these, maybe they might fit you, right? So I think sometimes it's about like stepping into that world, networking, asking a couple extra questions, um, and also just kind of building rapport with people so that they're okay to just maybe you know, tell you a little bit more than you asked for, things mm -hmm. like that. At least so far, that's how I feel like it's been going. But we're definitely looking for more sponsors, we're looking for more grants, because what, as we're out here, we're realizing we can't even execute all the ideas we have. We don't have enough time, we don't have enough money. But if we can create, you know, organize better, create more time, maybe get a couple more people on board, as well as have more funds, then we can literally help more people. And, and, and our pushes can go that much further. So yeah, th though we're looking for more, I'd say we've done, we've done all right, donations, grants, fundraising, you know, we, um, early on, we partnered with CFC, uh, Catalyst for Change. Kyle, they're out there in Biddeford, 
great organization. They, they uh, do a lot of different clothes that are really on a positive vibe, really about um, suicide prevention and awareness, really being strong and uh, being a warrior. Um, I just really appreciate the organization. They approached us and uh, had kind of a personal connection to what we were doing. And so we came together with uh, CFC and Black on Main and we kind of made a couple pieces of merch. Like uh, I deserve, I came up with this phrase, don't talk act. We printed that on the shirt, don't talk act. And then we sold a bunch of them and raised a couple thousand dollars in a week because I think people are really looking for something that resonates with them. Um, so I guess that would be the other thing I would say. Getting grants definitely matters, but I think also you have to find, you have to find your voice, but you also have to find what resonates with people. Like people really are galvanized and kind of energized right now. And it might not be a million people running, okay, a thousand people running around in the street in Portland right now with signs, but don't think that energy is completely dissipated. Sure. Right, so part of what I really think is about like finding how you can dip into it and what is resonating with people. Where are they? Like honestly, sometimes people aren't ready for all the change to happen at once. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we're not going to hold their feet to the fire, but we're trying to create spaces. Like just how I said, we're trying to create spaces for black folks and brown folks to be vibrant and do what they do. We're also learning day by day to create more space for people who are imperfect and people who just now woke up. Well, just because you just now woke up doesn't mean you're my enemy. I might need to teach you how to be a better ally, but when you wake up, it's time to get up, right? right? So for me, it really is about trying to create those spaces for people to feel okay and to learn and to, because um, to me, a lot of it is about awareness and then action. Mm -hmm. But again, don't talk, act. It's not about a bunch of arguments. Again, this is why we made that black owned Maine. If you want to vote with your dollars, for instance, one thing you can do is put your dollars into BIPOC businesses. You can do that. You don't have to get permission. You don't have to ask anybody. Sure. I mean, unless you're a minor, you know. Sure. Just saying. Uh, so for me, yeah, really it's about action and uh, getting resources to where they're needed. And that's a lot of what I hear y'all mm -hmm. talking about for sure. Um, yeah. Appreciate that. I think, uh, Luke, I've seen a lot of um, people that aren't very um, aware of the water problem. Um, I can remember one time my, uh, I, you know, my, the principal of my school, or maybe it was superintendent by then, wrote a letter to the editor of the paper thanking the Poland Springs Company for donating water to our school. I was like, dude, that is a marketing ploy of theirs. How do you not see that? Um, it's just an uphill battle, I think. But what kind of resources have you used to kind of help people understand about our water? Yeah, um, we've... Yeah, we've had to get creative over the years just because the uh, amount of money Nestle's pouring into our communities and, you know, water privatizers in general because of the resources they have are pouring into our communities with marketing campaigns is overwhelming at times. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at my uh, middle school, um, while, I was, while I was actually there um, and busy, you know, advocating against water privatization in Augusta and stuff like that, um, Poland Spring was making significant donations to my school and to the environmental program I was participating in. And, um, you know, that always made me feel super uneasy. So um, I always took the time to uh, bring it up in and out of class. Um, one of our most, successive, uh, most uh, successful sorry, um, methods has been um, simply stickers that say stolen spring. On I love them. those. I have one yeah. in my refrigerator. And those have home. resonated like crazy <laughs> with people. Just, you know, getting a very simple, concise message out that, you know, Poland Spring isn't the um, local good neighbor they present themselves to be. Mm -hmm. You know, they donate, you know, $1,000 here and $1,000 there to libraries, schools, and stuff like that. But that's, in reality, pennies on the dollar of what they're making in profits. You know, um, they're just here to make themselves look good. So almost every time I've started a conversation with someone who doesn't know about what Poland Spring is doing, or Nestle is doing, um, you know, they're like, oh, I only know them from, uh, from uh, you know, stuff like Project WET or education initiatives about hydrology and the environment, um, or that they donated to a local organization. But that's the intended effect. People, they want people to think of them as a good neighbor, which, um, you know, in reality, they're definitely not. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, definitely just, you know, engaging with people um, in simple ways that resonate with them, like, you know, stickers. 
has yeah. definitely been one of them. I uh, used to be ways. part of this mm. kind of political anti-corporate art troupe that would do mm. this Fourth of July play in West Athens, Maine, every year, and um, it got to be bigger and bigger until it was kind of out of control. But one year, mm. when it was about to tip over the edge, there was a float, and all it was was some guys on a flatbed truck, and they were throwing very, very chilled little small bottles of Poland Springs water out into the crowd. They weren't so big that it would like hurt someone if it hit them. And I was like, oh, the corporations have found West Athens 4th of July. Here they are. Um, it's very insidious. As a public school teacher for years, I was appalled at the extent to which corporations like Scholastic or, you know, the Gates Foundation and so forth, they just get their tentacles into these um, public entities that the taxpayers are supporting. Um, don't even get me started on military recruiters, but I always was like, we're the, the local taxpayers are struggling to pay the overhead to keep this structure in place. Why are we just giving it away to these multinational wealthy corporate entities? Can I say something real quick? Yeah, please. It was interesting. Uh, so I came to the state of Maine specifically to go to Bowdoin College, right? Mm -hmm. So that was my entry, and whoever yeah. was there was what I thought. And then later I got into town, and was like, oh, there's like Brunswick and cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But I remember seeing Poland Springs almost right off. Didn't know what it was. And I remember people in Maine would say, yeah, that's Maine water. I'd be like, oh, sweet. Okay, it's like a Maine brand. I'm sure Poland Springs is like some town or something I haven't been to yet. All right, cool. People like, oh, yeah, Maine's got good water. Cool. And then over time, as I'm drinking Poland, Sp Poland Springs and hearing about it, I remember the first time someone said, well, you know, Poland Springs is kind of messed up. I was like, what do you mean? I thought this was the good Maine water. Like, I mean, I'm from Texas, right? I seriously have yeah. no, I'm just like, what, why would you say that? I, everyone else says, they were like, yeah, but like, they're just like taking the good main water and then just like selling it to us. And I was like, that's weird. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. But to y'all's point, I see what you're saying. That's a weird thing. They don't want people to think about that vibe. Right. The vibe is like you said, I'm your neighbor, things like that. And I mean, I guess that's what corporations do, but it's, uh, it's one of those things that I feel like we should be aware of. Yes. For sure. Absolutely. Did they donate water? Uh, did Poland Springs or Nestle donate any water when the encampment was there? No, there was... plenty of community members did though, but not uh, no corporations, that's for sure. It's one of the things I always struggle with, like I feel bad about when there's something going on like that. It was super hot when they were camped out in on uh, City Hall. And I used to bring ice down. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt bad about it because again, you're turning water into a commodity, but it was desperately needed, and there were all these pallets of, of you know, shrink wrap, plastic bottled water. But the, you know, they don't even produce, provide porta potties for unhoused people in the city of Portland to use. They certainly don't provide like showers or clean running water or anything. So, yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, no, at the, uh, you know, it was crazy too. You know, during that encampment. Uh, there are a lot of people who were finding out about, you know, hey, there's this thing going on up at City Hall. You know, they were living down in the park. But, uh, you know, people were getting heat stroke. It was hot out. And, you know, if we hadn't been there with those, like the medic tent, the supply tent with, you know, cold water and popsicles, you know, how many people would have died in the summer? And, that, you know, now, now we're in the winter. It's cold. That same risk is still there. And there's just questions like, where are certain people going to go or how are they going to stay warm in the daytime or you know if you're going to use this facility now that was closed because it wasn't safe around covid why is it now safe for this other part of our community and not the other you know so it's it was just a really eye-opening experience to really see how many like deaths or harm was prevented in that encampment and I think that was something that didn't get highlighted enough is that like mm. that was a protest but it was also like like a necessity for some people to get through like the heat mm. and uh you know the water is a big thing you know like I've been out to Flint uh two years ago where they're having a huge water crisis that's been going on year after year mm -hmm. um you know that's one of our main things is like when we deliver water to people we don't want to buy it from nestle so uh and you can find companies that are not owned by nestle it's uh you know it still sucks that it's privatized but it's uh there are smaller businesses that you can like vote with your dollars and uh you know i i love that philosophy whether it's like where do you get your clothes or are you you know buying your burgers at a local business or a mcdonald's and uh 
you know, that's that's the way every day that you can uh, use your vote with your dollars for your morals and your priorities and, you know, stop funding the people hurting us too. And it's a really uh, important mindset to like inspire in people is that like, you know, every, yeah, you know, we vote every year on November 3rd, but like, what do you do in the rest of the year? Like, are you shopping at H&M where children are being abused on the other side of the world or are you going to buy from someone on you know like the black owned main directory that's keeping money in our community so it's you know it's really good when you collaborate because you can really like show people how many alternatives there are to these bad things that exist yeah, yeah it's one of the things my campaign talked about early on uh, we bought some facebook advertising mm -hmm. it's pretty cheap and you can target, you know. And um, then as we uh, raised more money and realized, okay, now we're ready to have like a real advertising campaign. So many of us were like, we don't want to advertise on Facebook. Facebook is a bad influence in our society. And, you know, I know, Adam, you use it. I use it. It's, you know, it's kind of uh, a necessary evil as, in terms of communications. And But we were like, we do not want to be sending money to those people. Let's keep the money in Maine. And, of course, when the pandemic hit, a lot of uh, Maine based journalism like they are struggling because their ad re revenues fell off and a lot of layoffs and you know um, our press coordinator Sam was saying you know a lot of these papers aren't even going to be in existence a year from now mm. so we made a decision like okay let's spend all our ad dollars in Maine to support Maine media and you know reach the people that we need to reach and um, I know uh, sometimes good creative is a, a substitute for media that you can't afford um, uh, take back the tap is a slogan that I heard years ago, maybe even before I heard of you, Luke, that I always thought was a pretty um, uh, uh, intelligent way to redirect people back to, you have a public water supply, and if you're not in a city like Flint where they like took over the city government and put it into like a private receivership, and then that manager you know, made a bad decision about where they were gonna draw the water from, and it corroded their old pipes, and lead got into the water, and then, pediatricians started realizing these kids have lead poisoning and you know it's just a if you haven't read that book what the eyes can't see by dr mona hana atisha i recommend it highly but um is take back the tap still like part of what community water justice is working on um i think fundamentally like when what we're talking about in terms of like keeping um water ownership in the hands of the people um yes in terms of like the specific phrase, we haven't uh, used that in our messaging lately, but um, it's definitely like, you know, I remember hearing take back the tap a lot, especially when I was young, a much younger uh, activist. Um, and I think that's, you know, the, uh, definitely the message um, still remains true in our organizing today. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, for sure. When I was helping uh, high school students learn how to write grant applications, and they had identified, we want to get those kind of drinking fountains that you can fill up your water bottle at. You know, they're designed to do that. You just stick the water, and it counts. It gives you a count of how many plastic bottles you didn't use. Um, the, the kids that raised the money and wrote the successful grant wanted to put, uh, get out, uh, 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 take back the tap on the bottles because they thought it was a cool slogan. And the principal, I think it was that same guy, was like, well, it sounds too much like beer, so we can't have that. <laughs> but this whole idea that um, Nestle has put, uh, you know, millions of dollars into convincing people like the water that comes out of your tap, it's not really good drinking water. Right. And, the, and then they do scientific studies where they look at, they test the quality of water that comes out of bottles and comes out of the tap, and the water that comes out of the tap is usually better, way better. Some bottled water is just literally taken out of taps and put into... Um, so, you know, there's, there's reality and then there's advertising, but I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't admit I used to work in advertising. I think uh, what people perceive to be the truth is often more powerful than what is the truth. Um, talk to me a little bit about black owned Maine uh, advertising or marketing, messaging. Do you guys help with that? Do, is there like a peer support network where businesses help each other or? Well, one thing that came to mind as I jump into that you know, part of what you just talked about is advertising, marketing, and you see these this like trickery. And I think it's important to, to also admit out loud that, you know, influence in this world is r real, but also the reasons that you influence people, what you try to influence them to do, whether or not you have their best interest in mind as you influence them, all of that matters. 
right? I'm just saying advertising isn't inherently evil. Marketing isn't evil. Selling things to people isn't evil. We need our economy to spin around so that we all, right? I don't know, can't get cool shoes if they don't make cool shoes, right? But is it manipulation? Are you worried about, are you considering what this will mean and impact on the other end? So I'm just saying, to me, that's just a, a critical thing to point out. Uh, when it comes to black-owned Maine, we, I mean, in, in one sense, uh, at our core, we are a marketing company, right? You know, what we do is we put the word out about things and we spread awareness and we challenge things and we, and we bring uh, knowledge and awareness to people who maybe hadn't been paid so much attention to before. So we are, I mean, that's our world, our, our world is, as well. You know, I can say that we've been able to achieve what we have without uh, paying for any Facebook or Instagram marketing or anything like that. It's all been organic, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a bit mind blowing for, for me. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I think there was a need, there was a void and we were the thing to fill it. Definitely a lot of content creation in what we do. Uh, I've, I've now, when I, <laughs> I meet people, so I'm a content creator. Uh, I, I wouldn't have said that a year ago because now I'm understanding how important it is to capture different things and to share them and then to also make it palatable or beautiful or engaging for people. And to me, again, a lot of those things point to advertising and marketing, but you know, we just, for us, it's about engaging people. It's about keeping their attention. It's about, again, sometimes challenging them. I remember around, um, I believe it was around Juneteenth, um, we had a post. Uh, I did like a little editing, but really it was Rose who made the post. And it got, it got shared like over a thousand times, maybe even like 1,700 times all over, not just in Maine. And it was just this infographic a couple layers deep on a carousel um, just talking about some of the race reality. And, and um, again, Juneteenth is, uh, people talk about the 4th of July and the celebration of America and stuff. And, and then they forget like where black people were specifically in America on that Independence Day. <laughs> they weren't. Not independent. Independent, right? And so black people have Juneteenth, which I believe should be celebrated fervently by all Americans, but a lot of people just don't know about it or care. Or, oh, that's another time black people try to change something and make it da, da, da. Okay. But we just gave people some straight up facts. And you just find people really voraciously hungry for facts. Mm -hmm. Not like spin, not per se what they always see on the news, but like somebody teach me something because they're not teaching it to you in school. Unfortunately, I don't think I was ever taught about Juneteenth in school. I was definitely an adult, pretty old adult by the time I ever even heard of it, mm. I would say. Adam, a lot of the work that you do with um, your, the community organizations that you're in is exactly the uh, front-facing, uh, mm. putting the message out. And um, what are the challenges of that work? Well, um, you know, stigma is a big one that I find... Uh, Issues get stigmatized, populations get stigmatized, uh, even solutions get stigmatized. You know, when we talk about, you know, overdose prevention sites, the common things, oh, you just want to give people drugs or you want to enable their addiction, not realizing that there's actual evidence that shows diseases go down and people, more people get sober and less people die. Um, so, you know, like stigma is a, like a multi-layered problem. You know, whether it's the people with substance use disorder or the issue itself and uh, housing too, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of times you'll hear, uh, go, why don't they just get a job? Well, a lot of the people there do have jobs and they live in a tent and they go to work every day. It's, it's a miracle in my opinion that, that you know, people have that kind of persistence. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, if you take yourself outside that box, like you really see like the lunacy of like, how strong and perseverant the, like these individuals are and yet they're being talked to like they're lazy or don't care enough or maybe they they don't deserve uh, a hand up out of this situation that like a lot of people fall into homelessness because no fault of their own you know your building gets sold they can kick everyone out of the building and there might not be enough apartments for you to find one next thing you know you're living in your car um, so it's uh, like, kind of like you said, like the messaging, the optics, like people want to know facts, you know, not, not the spin. Um, you know, one thing that like is really important to me too is like to not be divisive when presenting the facts. You know, we're, we're, we see so much division and people at each other over the differing beliefs or opinions on things. And, 
you know, the common thread is that, the, you know, the elected officials that we're hiring to fix problems in our society aren't fixing them. And, you know, I hate seeing people blaming each other mm -hmm. because the officials aren't solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you present things with the facts and the no spin, it uh, becomes a lot easier to bring people together around a common goal, mm -hmm. like ending homelessness or, you know, ending a war on drugs that's really just a war on American people that has disproportionately affected, you know, like the BIPOC communities or the unhoused communities. And uh, mm -hmm. we have to be working together as the people to solve these things. And like when we can like look to ourselves as the solution, like that's the one, that's when things will really change for everyone. Mm. It always seems weird to me that we stigmatize poverty, yet hoarding mm -hmm. wealth is admirable in late stage capitalism. Right. Like that's just hoarding, you know? And if you, um, you know, if you would provide a, a guaranteed basic income to people, they would spend that money in the community. They yeah. would pay their rent. They would buy groceries and clothes and mm -hmm. so forth. You give more money to Jeff Bezos at Amazon and he just hoards it. And it yeah. doesn't go back into the economy. So it's a weird, uh, you know, we've, we've been sold a, a very strange outlook on life, I think, to kind of keep these systems in place. And it's pretty clear that our corporate overlords would rather see a civil war than a revolution because they're afraid the people are going to become yeah. so austerity is just going to become uh, so extreme that the people are going to say what else do we have to lose and rise up so i think that a lot of mass media corporate media is is purposely pitting groups against each other and making us think that you know all of us have far more in common with each other than we do with a uh, you know trillionaire over there um, but we're sold all kinds of crazy ideas so. and, uh I um, always like to say they're manufactured problems and issues, uh, you know, with homelessness at least. There's something like five or ten empty houses in America right now per person that doesn't have a home. Mm. Like, homelessness shouldn't exist. There's a, so you really look at these problems like these issues are being created, then these people are profiting off of the solution to these issues, so there's no incentive to solve the problems. and. Uh, the media's just become the tool to make sure we're distracted enough that we don't get it. And, you know, divide and conquer, it's uh, historically the most effective way to prevent change. And uh, I wish more people would just look up how that is done to populations and communities so you can understand when it's happening and defy those tactics because it's yes. it happens to everyone mm -hmm. in, in places like this you're reminding me that we did a webinar back when everybody really was staying home all the time on homelessness and we had sherry honkala was one of the presenters and she's been working in uh, philadelphia for years with she was a single mom that became homeless and she ended up breaking into a vacant house and just living in it saying i got kids here i got to take care of them so now she's part of a community group that actually uh supports people and enables people empowers people to do that and they send uh emissaries out if you invite them to portland they will come and work with your community to learn how to uh you know kind of take over housing that's not being used because people are hoarding it and um other you know people are sleeping outside in the cold so um Crazy problems sometimes require solutions that might seem a little crazy because they're out of the box, but then when you think them through, they're, they seem fairly, uh, fairly reasonable. So we are uh, nearing the end of our time. This has been a great conversation. I wonder if you would think about folks that are listening at home or that will listen to this recorded, if you could do one ask of them to help uh, make the world a better place. You don't even have to stick to your issue or your organizations if you don't want to, but one ask that you would make of your fellow humans right now, what would that be? You want to go first, Lou? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, um, I would recommend paying attention to local politics. Um, you know, recently national politics, of course, have been an incredibly divisive um, and uh, exhausting uh, scene to pay attention to. Um, you're one of the few figures who's giving me hope right now in terms of the national political scene. Um, and I think local politics are where a lot of um, immediate and sustainable changes can be made. Um, you know, having friendly 
uh, water district members or school board members or uh, city council members um, can make a tremendous difference in a number of local campaigns, um, whether you're paying attention to um, racial justice organizing that's going on right here in Portland or um, water justice organizing that, you know, that was happening in my hometown of Freiburg a few years ago and other communities across Maine that are resisting water privatizers. Um, so, you know, um, I would ask that um, you reach out to local organizations, just ask what you can do to help. Um, we really have to uh, think globally and act locally. Um, and um, yeah, and just uh, support local campaigns um, and uh, organizations. Um, mutual aid is really important. Um, have yeah. you run for office yet? No, I'm actually working. Do you think you will? I don't know yet. <laughs> um, I'm actually right now I'm working on a city, uh, a Portland uh, school board campaign um, for uh, Nilet Billu for school board at large. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know for myself. I, I definitely like the grassroots organizing element. Uh -huh. But um, yeah. Oh yeah, and also I've got it. Well, yeah. Thank you. That's it. Sure. Adam, what, do you, what, would, what would you be your ask of our listeners at home? Um, I would challenge uh, viewers today to do just one good deed every day for somebody in need, whether it's small or big. Um, there's a saying that's kind of circulated on the internet in meme format, uh, small acts of kindness when multiplied by millions of people could change the world. So, uh, you know, while we're fighting all these causes which are clearly long processes and take time, we can all reduce harm for each other and alleviate suffering by just being, you know, the best neighbors and community members we can be. And, uh, you know, the nicer and more loving we are and give back to each other, you know, the more tolerable it's going to be waiting and fighting for these changes. So I think that's a, that's a really important one. Great. Thank you. Wow. Jerry? Those are good. Okay. <laughs> um, High standard here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Um, what I'm thinking, you know, an, an, an analogy that I use often to help people to better understand systemic, systemic issues, systemic change. Uh, I had a good friend down where I'm from in Texas who one day we were going back and forth and he was like, man, people always say systemic. Like, just what does that really mean? I was like, wow, honest question. Honest question. Just because people throw these words out, you know, like all the words in the Pledge of Allegiance. How old were you when you knew what all those words meant? <laughs> Right? But how many times did you say them right. before that? Anyway, so I'm not even going to jump into that, but the point I'm making is that people need to think more systemically. You have to understand these issues. Everything we're talking about, everything you've been talking about, not just your last argument on Facebook or the people that you saw protesting or just the last meme you saw like that. Those are all like the ends of like the tendrils hanging. But in reality, there's this whole thing that's creating all of that, right? Right? Going to a protest and screaming in someone's face yeah. is important, but there's a whole system that created whatever it is. So my advice is to start to pay attention to systems, not just your favorite politicians, not just your favorite news source. I often look at opposing news sources and then meditate on the fact that the truth is somewhere in the middle. None of them are going to tell me the truth. Some of them don't even know the truth. Think systemically. Don't just jump into arguments. Don't just try to change people's minds understand systems and then work like the people on this stage seriously to effect systemic change uh, analogy wise i try to tell people if you go to the doctor and you have a little rash right here they're going to be like hey here's some ointment to go right here because there's a localized issue a week later the rash is gone what if someone unfortunately is diagnosed with leuke leukemia and throughout their bloodstream there are different cancerous agents no salve on a spot is going to fix that or counteract that. They have to take chemicals into their body, that radiation, right? Because to attack something systemically, your approach has to be systemic, right? So I just want to say that out loud, learn to think more systemically. Stop just arguing with individuals, study systems. I love that. that I, I, that's exactly the way I think. And I think some people are big picture thinkers and some people are more, you know, and I respect both ways of thinking and, and some of us get uh, a lot done doing one, and some of us get a lot done doing the other. But, right. you know, my ask is going to be something incredibly tiny of people listening, so small. Um, 
I've been organizing around climate and militarism, around the military budget, about pushing back on recruitment in high schools and you know, uh, uh, retiring native mascots that were demeaning stereotypes and all sorts of issues. And I've been usually a communications person in those movements. As those are kind of my, you know, strengths. But I've marched. I've met with my elected officials. I've protested. I've gotten arrested. I've done petitions. I've written letters. I've, you know, called people and started you know, groups and so forth. I've done a lot of things and to try to change. And sometimes it works and sometimes you have a little success and sometimes you're um, up against something much bigger than yourself. Um, but people, uh, so, you know, when people kind of came to me a year ago, summer, and said, would you consider running for the U.S. Senate against Susan Collins as, as a Green under ranked choice voting? It's ranked choice voting. It's a game changer that, you know, it's not, it's not the false dichotomy first past the post. You're, you wouldn't be a spoiler. In fact, you'd be bringing more progressive voice into the race and giving people something to get more excited about and stuff. So I had not, I mean, I'd been an elected union official before, like union negotiator, but I had never run for elected office. And it's been quite an experience, a big learning experience, certainly. Um, but that leads me to my ask. And my ask is this, the tiniest thing I did this year, the tiniest political act was the other day I voted in my pajamas. I was, uh, I had to move from my home in Solon because there isn't enough broadband internet to Zoom where I live up in the second district in the like foothills of the Western mountains. Mm -hmm. And so I've been staying with friends in Bath. My husband came down for the weekend. Um, he had brought me my absentee ballot and I marked it and I handed it back to him and he took it, he hand carried it back to the town clerk because I can support the post office other ways this year. I'm a little leery of mailing my ballot in, but um, you know, that's like the smallest political act I'll do this year. It's tiny. It's not going to change much of anything for me to mark that one, rank myself first, you know, whatever. Um, but it's so crucial because if I don't do it and, you know, you don't do it and they don't do it, then we end up with uh, people will blame a spoiler candidate, but really it's all the people that didn't vote. Maine has high voter turnout and we maybe get like 60%. It's looking like this year might be record turnout, in part because it's easier to vote this year because of the pandemic and absentee voting. So I'm going to urge everybody to make a plan to vote. If you haven't done it already, make a plan. Do you guys have a plan to vote? I've already voted. You already voted? I'm actually literally someone just messaged me because we're figuring out a plan tonight. Cool. cool. Yes. Oh, cool. No. And Luke, are you old enough to vote yet? No, nope, I'm still a senior in high school. Not yet. Just okay. a few months off. All right. Well, you're doing an awful lot as a senior in high school, and I appreciate all of you being here with me. This has been a great conversation. It was so nice to meet you, Jerry, and uh, you know, thanks for coming all this way to be with us, Luke. And Adam, always a pleasure. I think this is three nights in a row we've been in action together when we were the other. So um, thanks, everybody, for uh, listening in, and please share this, and uh, we uh, hope to see you soon. Take care. Thanks, guys. Good job.